Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar. We're going to be getting started in just another minute. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you being here. This is our last webinar for 2022, so thank you for tuning in. Um, our, some other upcoming events starting in 2023, we have a webinar on Wednesday, January 18th on home office ergonomics post COVID-19 with Dr. Carissa Harris in the California Labor Lab. The following week, Wednesday, January 25th, we will have a webinar on the home as a workplace with Dr. Eileen Boris in the California Labor Lab. Our next industrial hygiene themed webinar will be on Tuesday, February 7th, and our topic will be lithium batteries, understanding the technology, hazards, and safety risks. That will be with Paul Harper, MBA, and the Northwest Center for Occupational Health and Safety. We're also looking forward to our annual conference, COEH Builds Bridges, Algorithm-Based Work, Wearables, and Surveillance. That'll be in Sacramento, California, on February 2nd to, or 3rd to 4th, 2023. For more, you can visit us on, at coeh at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. And without further ado, it is my pleasure on behalf of education and research centers throughout the country to present the Industrial Hygiene Webinar Series. This is a collaborative effort on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program and aspires to provide access to current research supported through NIOSH ERC programs. Appreciate you being here. Today's webinar, E-Cigarette Aerosol Exposures, Select Biomarkers and Vape Shop Workers, is brought to you by Dr. Charlene Wynn and the Southern California NIOSH Education and Research Center. A few housekeeping items, you will be muted during the presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the online Q&A, and we'll save time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as possible. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health YouTube page. And all participants who logged in with their registration email for the full live presentation today will receive an email tomorrow, the link to the evaluation form that will qualify you for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. Once the evaluation is completed, you'll be able to access and print your certificate. And it's my pleasure to welcome our presenter today, Charlene Wynn, MS, PhD. Dr. Wynn is a graduate of the Southern California Education and Research Center, earning her master's degree in 2016 and a PhD in 2022 in industrial hygiene from the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. Under the supervision of Dr. Yifeng Zhu, her graduate research focused on assessing and reducing occupational exposures in indoor air pollutants in nail salons and vape shops. Dr. Wynn is currently a program supervisor at the South Coast Air Quality Management District, developing regulations addressing criteria, pollutants, and toxics from stationary and mobile emission sources. Thank you so much for being here with us. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction, Michelle. Um, so I'll be um, going right into the webinar. Um, for an overview of today's webinar, um, I'll first provide some background on vaping and vape shops. Next, I will briefly discuss um, an initial indoor air quality study I conducted briefly to, to um, uncover what kind of exposures vape shop workers may be subject to. Uh, then I will go into the main topic of today, which is an exploratory study looking at vape shop worker exposure to e-cigarette aerosols, and then I'll round out today's webinar with uh, some conclusions and lessons learned from the pilot study and any remaining research gaps. So in the last 15 years, uh, vaping has emerged as a popular tobacco smoking alternative that delivers nicotine to the user uh, via inhalation of a heated mixture of propylene glycol or PG, vegetable glycerin or VG, and water. E-cigarettes have become widely used among smokers and non-smokers, and it's become a multi-billion dollar market um, owing to the variety of e-cig devices and flavors that the e-liquids come in, 
And in the meantime, there's a growing amount of research uh, that has come out about the potential health impacts of these products. Um, so in terms of the research, negative impacts have been shown, um, particularly with habitual e-cig users, as well as naive e-cig users or um, e-cig users that are vaping for the first time. Um, some main findings in terms of negative impacts include cardiovascular risk, impaired respiratory function, and induction of carcinogenic activity. And there's also a risk for secondhand exposure to e-cig related air pollutants. So where can folks buy e-cigs? Uh, nowadays you can buy them online, but the primary form of distribution for e-cigs is in the vape or smoke shops. Vape shops um, are retail establishments that exclusively sell vape products. They allow customers to sample e-liquids and the custom customers can also get their devices repaired there. If you've ever been inside a smoke shop or a convenience store, the vape shop is laid out in a similar format. Um, you have display cases, you have a counter, like you see here on the bottom picture on the right, where the employee employee is stationed there and customers can come up, uh, take a look at the different merchandise that the store offers um, and ask for any kind of um, service that they want, such as you know trying a new uh, vape flavor, um, if their coils are broken or they need to be, um, the cotton needs to be um, re, um, refashioned inside uh, the coils, um, the employee could do that for you. Um, but you'll also see in the vape shop, there's a section uh, like here on the left side of this bottom picture uh, where there's couches, coffee table. So this is place acts as almost a lounge. So, you know, customers can come in or, or patrons um, can come in and hang out with the employees, hang out with other customers. Um, or, you know, customers uh, can wait here in this waiting area. And um, what are these customers doing there while they're vaping, while they're hanging out? They're also vaping too. They can vape at their leisure um, inside the vape shop. So the shops act more than just a retail spot. They're also a lounge for uh, vaping enthusiasts, which makes them a site of secondhand exposure to e-cig aerosols. So secondhand Hand vaping aerosols, or I call them, I will refer to them here uh, for the rest of the presentation as exhaled e-cig aerosols. Uh, they have been found to contain various air pollutants, which are listed here on the right. Um, the negative impacts that I mentioned previously are from studies of mainstream e-cig aerosol insulation, inhalation. So um, uh, those negative impacts are largely studied among those who are directly inhaling the e-cig aerosol. Uh, but there is a limited amount of literature about the impacts from secondhand exposure. Um, to minimize exposure to these air pollutants, um, vaping has been included in many smoke-free regulations for public areas, workplaces, and indoor venues. However, there are some states, including California, that allow vaping in certain indoor environments, such as vape shops. Thus, vape shops may be a highly impacted space for worker exposure to, e to exhaled e-cig aerosols. So as a potential occupational hazard, uh, indoor air impacts from e-cig aerosols have been studied in lab and some real world settings such as homes and public e-cig conventions. And exposure assessments have been done um, with acute exposure events, naive or non-smoking e-cig use and residents living in living with e-cig users. However, these impacts haven't been studied much in workplaces or among workers that have a continuous exposure to e-cig aerosols. So knowing that there may be potential occupational hazard, I go in and do, um, I went in and did, um, a preliminary study looking at the indoor air quality in vape shops, knowing that there's potential secondhand exposure and that the exhaled e aerosols release um, or contain um, air pollutants. So several studies have been conducted to characterize indoor air quality impact of vaping with respect to particle concentrations. For instance, inside a vaping convention, 
this is um, this vaping convention was held in, in a large hotel. Uh, the particle number concentration, PM 2.5 levels, can get as high as three orders of magnitude above background indoor levels during vaping activity. Um, you can see that on the top right figure. Um, and I put in a reference um, uh, of what the PM 2.5 level is in uh, the, in a um, Fielding School of Public Health office. Um, and you can see that the um, while there's vaping activity going on, um, the PM 2.5 levels become really, really elevated um, compared to a typical um, indoor setting such as uh, an office. Now with particle size drift distribution that has also been measured and it's been found that exhaled east aerosols uh, tend to be in the ultra fine range so these aerosols are very small and can penetrate deep into your lungs and with respect to distance particle concentrations of exhaled e aerosols decrease significantly as you get farther away from an e-cig user this shows that these aerosols are highly evaporative So knowing these findings from previous literature, I set out to investigate the indoor air quality inside vape shops. Um, the findings um, that I'm, I'm going to present to you, um, they're also found in, um, they're, they're published in a study. You can find that in the Atmospheric Environment Journal. So in um, my study, uh, looking at indoor air quality of vape shops, um, I measure temporal and spatial trends of PM 2.5 and particle number concentration, as well as particle size distribution at six representative vape shops. What I found was during business hours, PM 2.5 and particle number concentration were continuously elevated due to the repeated vaping activity going on by the employees and customers. Because of the constant vaping, um, as well as the low air exchange rates that I also measured in these shops, uh, exhaled e aerosols um, persisted in the air with uh, PM 2.5 decaying faster than particle number concentration over farther distance uh, from the vaping bar. So um, if you refer back to the uh, uh, picture that I showed of the vape shop layout, the vaping bar um, is where the counter uh, is where you can test out the e-liquid samples you, um, you know, you can, most of the business transactions happen at that counter. And so that's where it, it acts almost like a bar too, because you, if you can see in that picture, there are stools. So that's where most of the vaping activity is going on. Um, that's the employees and customers um, maybe vaping with each other. Um, so um, that's where much of the vaping was occurring. So um, I'll go into um, give you a vis more visual representation of the results. So here are the temporal profiles of particle number concentration and PM 2.5 during business hours. As you can see, um, the black line represents the indoor um, particle concentrations. And so you see that when the shop doors open um, for both particle number and PM 2.5, um, you see that um, because there's um, outdoor air mixing in with the indoor air, um, the, the concentrations follow well with each other indoor and outdoor. So anytime you see a spike, that's uh, directly from um, the, somebody uh, exhaling e aerosol. Uh, but when you close the shop door, so you um, don't allow any air exchange uh, with the outdoor air, you see that the concentrations remain elevated. You still see some spikes, but in terms of um, the the decay of the aerosols, you don't see that quick decay that you see while the shop doors are open. And you start to see that there's a huge gap between the outdoor levels and the indoor levels. Next, um, just with the uh, particle number and PM 2.5 concentrations, um, these levels are in the range as what's been measured in smoking venues and hookah lounges. Now for particular 
with PM 2.5, the mean concentrations at the six shops that uh, I sampled um, across all the uh, different ventilation settings um, that these shops um, are at uh, a default, um, these levels exceeded the national ambient air quality standard for primary and secondary formation of PM 2.5. And so that level is 35 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, you can see here on the right, that's where that level is. And you can see um, the PM 2.5 concentrations um, in the vape shops. Um, the, they, the mean uh, concentrations um, highly exceed that level. So this poses potentially, mm. um, with respect to PM 2.5, uh, there may be um, a health risk. And so you see as you um, increase uh, in terms of um, air exchange rate, you know, you get better in the ventilation type. Um, you see that the concentrations also decrease too. So that's one identifying factor um, other than high vaping activity that also contributes to the particle concentration amounts um, inside the vape shop. Unlike the previous finding in the patient room that I indicated um, a few slides ago, a large percent of particle number concentration PN2.5 remained in the vape shop when farther away from the vaping bar. Um, air, air exchange rate is a contributing factor, but um, as you can see, the vape shop in the vape shop environment, vaping aerosols persist and mix in the air. So when someone's farther away, um, like meters away from the e-cig user, um, inside the vape shop, we still saw that um, the uh, person could still be substantially exposed to um, exhaled e-cig aerosols. So um, I provide here the ranges in terms of the um, concentration levels for particle number and PM 2.5. Um, as you can see that um, although you get farther away, the, the number decreases, but there's still a high percent um, that's, that still remains or is still found even though when you're meters away. And then of course, with air exchange rate being a contributing factor, you see that um, a shop with the higher air exchange rate, um, you see more decay than a shop with lower air exchange rate. As for particle size distribution, um, you see a bimodal trend when the shop doors are closed in the ultra fine range on a larger and a larger particle size range at 250 uh, nanometers. But when you open the shop doors, um, so you see the graph um, as you move, this left graph as you move to the right, um, the particle size distribution becomes more unimodal. Uh, this indicates that the outdoor air is mixing and diluting the exhaled e aerosols. Now, um, on the right side, when it's, it's uh, less vaping activity, there's a much tamer uh, distribution, still that unimodal distribution that we see um, on the right side of the left graph. Um, that's further showing that high vaping activity and low air exchange rate are the main factors making vape shops a potentially problematic workplace. So now on to the main topic of the hour. Seeing that vape shops are a highly impacted workspace as highlighted in the indoor air study results. The next step is um, to do an exposure assessment of the vape shop workers and see what kind of effects exposure to e cig aerosol products, I'm sorry, um, what kind of effects exposure to e cig aerosols pro may produce while working in a vape shop. So with this pilot study, I was able to characterize changes in select urinary bio biomarker concentrations measured in vape shop workers within one work shift and across multiple consecutive work shifts. Um, I also was able to identify um, potential, some potential predictors of exposure and effect from exhaled e aerosol exposure in vape shops. And then um, using the biomarker level results results that um, I found in um, measuring inside the vape shop workers' urines um, compare um, the biomarker level changes um, in vape shop workers with um, tobacco smokers 
um, using um, existing literature for widely studied nicotine exposure, oxidative stress, and systemic inflammation markers. So mm -hmm. just, just with biomarkers, there are a number of studies that have been done showing notable impacts from e-cig use and secondhand exposure. So first, um, with just absorbing um, e-cig related nicotine after secondhand or passive exposure, um, this has been studied in non-smoking residents of e-cig using homes. So, and um, with non-smoking attendees at an e-cig convention. So you can see on the top right graph, um, there's, um, uh, nicotine uh, was sampled um, among attendees um, at different sampling points before um, and then after, and then the next morning um, after they attended a, a ESA convention. And then you see that um, the um, cotinine levels in the urine um, increased. So there is um, secondhand absorption of um, ESA uh, related nicotine. Um, there's also been some um, negative health impacts demonstrated from e-cig use or aerosol inhalation, uh, particularly among habitual e-cig users. There's increased cardiac sympathetic activity and oxidative stress. And then among um, first-time e-cig users, um, there's been um, elevated oxidative stress and inflammation um, after just one um, e-cig use session. Um, and then um, with looking at uh, biomarkers, um, and these are um, the same biomarkers that I will, that I uh, measured in my study, um, comparing between um, e-cigarette, cigarette users and non-smokers, um, one study found um, elevated um, stress and inflammation markers uh, among e-cig users um, at, um, similar level to cigarette smokers um, compared to non-smokers. So um, using these studies as inspiration, I went out and conducted um, workplace exposure to e-cig aerosols, focusing on vape shop workers. So for this study, um, I recruited 15 e-cig users and 15 non-e-cig users. So um, the reason why I split it up um, into these two to have a um, two to have a two comparison groups since vape shop workers um, are also e-cig users and then there's a number that don't use e-cig users so this they have um, sort of di differing um, exposure profiles and then on uh, a work week for, for each uh, vape shop worker that I was able to recruit um, for those that had a consecutive workday schedule. So they worked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, I collected uh, two urine samples um, on their, the, start, the first day of their consecutive workday schedule. So um, one urine sample um, at the start of their shift and then another sample at the end of their shift. Um, and then the same thing for that worker on the last day of their consecutive workday schedule. And then a second set of workers um, that I found they didn't have a consecutive workday schedule. They would work like a Friday and then not work on Saturday and then work on a Sunday. Um, I followed the same format to um, start and ending urine um, samples at the start and end of their shift on both days. So um, the reason why I just collected um, urine samples um, within their workday shift is to, to be able to best capture um, just e-cig aerosol exposure during um, their workday. So, you know, a lot of, you know, there could be a case where they come home um, and uh, use e-cig, use an e-cig or be exposed to secondhand e-cig exposure when they go out and hang out with their friends, et cetera. Um, I didn't want those to be um, sort of confounding factors. So I designed the study just to capture um, workplace exposure to e-cig aerosols. And so within um, each urine sample, 
um, I focused on um, measuring cotinine, which is a nic nicotine metabolite. So this represents exposure to ESIC aerosols. And then I also measured uh, effect biomarkers. So these include oxidative stress biomarkers, um, 8-OHDG and 8-isoprostane, uh, and then an inflammation marker, um, the C-reactive uh, protein, and then metal toxicity mm. or antioxidant activity marker, which is um, represented by um, the metallothionine uh, biomarker. And during the shift, um, I also measured um, area uh, air nicotine um, using a, a pass, uh, an active sampler, sorry. Uh, and um, I also took field observations um, and uh, administered surveys to the subjects uh, to capture um, any potential predictors or confounding factors. So for uh, the effect biomarkers that I select, for urine analysis, these are large, been widely studied um, uh, among tobacco smokers as well as um, uh, ESIC, um, existing ESIC studies as well. So, you know, 8 OHDG, um, that's an oxidative DNA damage marker. Um, it has um, a half life of about six hours. So, um, but, and peak excretion uh, up to 24 hours. Uh, so um, with this biomarker, um, I thought it was um, the best in terms of being representative of, um, compared to other um, uh, oxidative stress markers, I thought that was um, best in terms of capturing um, any kind of effect across um, a work shift at a vape shop. Um, similarly with 8-isoprostane, um, that's also an oxidative stress marker, but it measures a lipid peroxidation. Um, the half-life um, uh, uh, ranges from minutes to hours time frame and also has a peak excretion uh, up to 24 hours. And then for a human C-reactive protein, CRP, um, this one measures systemic inflammation um, so the half-life is 13 to 16 hours. So that's um, similar to the half-life of uh, um, urinary cotinine, which is 16 to 19 hours. Um, and the peak excretion up to two or three days is um, also in the same, close to the same time frame as cotinine as well. So um, this is all, uh, also um, a good candidate. And since I'm also measuring um, these biomarkers, over um, con a consecutive um, or multiple work shift period. And then with metallothionine, um, this marker is um, in response to heavy metal, metal, heavy metal exposure. It also protects against um, this uh, marker gets expressed um, when it's uh, trying to protect against metal toxicity um, and reactive oxygen species scavenging. Um, it has a a longer half-life and a longer peak excretion um, compared to cotinine and the other um, effect biomarkers. So uh, this um, marker um, may be more appropriate if um, you're measuring the body burden from um, exposure to metal constituents. So next, uh, just quickly over the data analysis, um, I use repeated remeasures and COVA um, to calculate adjusted biomarker concentration means. I also use this to detect um, any differences within shift and across the multiple sampling points um, with the post hoc pairwise comparisons using uh, uh, the two keys um, HSD test um, to see if there's um, association between um, predictors and um, biomarker the cotinine with the effect of biomarker concentrations. I also used um, linear mixed effects models and then um, included um, subject um, and or vape shop as random effects in different model variations and included age, sex, BMI, and, and mar any marijuana use um, as fixed effects. So with particularly with this um, linear effects model analysis, I 
did um, two types of analyses, one focusing on the raw concentrations of the effect um, and exposure biomarkers, and then um, another analysis looking at um, the change in the biomarker concentrations um, from start to end of the shift. So I took a ratio of, of the biomarker concentrations each day um, and um, you know, using the predictors that I measured, um, such as the time-weighted average air nicotine uh, concentration that I measured during the shift, um, I uh, did a, a association analysis uh, with that. Um, and then, um, you know, for uh, vaping status, I also included that um, as an indicator vader variable in the analysis since um, vaping and non-vaping subjects have uh, different exposure profiles. So um, continuing on, um, so here are the results in terms of um, what uh, the demographics, the characteristics of the vape shop workers that I studied. So, um, you know, 15 vaping, 15 non-vaping, it is a small sample size. Um, and you can see, um, particularly with um, gender or with sex, um, under the vaping group, there's a lot more male, only one female subject. And then among non-vaping, um, it becomes about half male, half female. And we know that um, with gender, there's um, different um, expressions in the biomarkers, um, uh, particularly with a isoprostate and metallothionine that seems to be more higher expressed among females. And so I counted uh, for that, those differences in my um, data analyses. Another thing is with marijuana use. So um, what I discovered as I was um, trying to recruit studies was um, there's quite a number of these vape shop workers that also um, use marijuana um, either you know um, on a regular basis or just sometimes. Um, and um, in order for me to have even just a decent number of subjects, um, or you know, I would recruit the subject with no marijuana use as um, uh, exclusion variable. Um, but then later, hearing that oh, they actually um, were exposed to um, you know marijuana, or they use marijuana, um, I just ended up including them these subjects also. So in terms of um, marijuana use among the vape shop workers. Um, you can see there's uh, quite a number that um, use it um, um, between vaping and non-vaping. Um, so there's a high prevalence, uh, substantial prevalence of marijuana use among these vape shop workers. And I controlled for that in the data analysis. And then um, here are sort of represent, representing um, the air nicotine concentrations during the shift, as well as the vaping density during the shift. Um, so you can see the numbers here on the right in my study, um, they're smaller than um, what's been uh, reported in previous studies. So my study, I conducted this, I had to conduct it during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so of course, you know, customer traffic, vaping activity, um, decrease during uh, COVID-19. Um, so the numbers on the left that I present at the bottom, they these are um, figures that are representative of um, vaping activity before the pandemic. So um, during my study, um, these air nicotine concentrations and vaping density, density were lower. Um, and something also to point out, um, among vaping, um, because the vaping employees are also um, vaping as well, um, about 40% um, of the vaping density is attributed to um, the vaping worker themselves. And then uh, for among non-vaping workers during their shift, um, about half of the vaping activity was from their coworkers who also vape. So just um, some things to note uh, in terms of the vape shop worker uh, characteristics. So as expected, um, cotinine levels are much higher among vaping workers uh, than non-vaping workers. So 
um, here, this is uh, presents the unadjusted and adjusted means uh, among uh, the vaping and non-vaping subjects, um, just pooled together uh, the um, urinary concentrations of the biomarkers across all the sampling points. Um, so as for the effect markers, on average, the A8OHDG and CRP markers are similar among vaping and non-vaping workers, which is surprising um, given that um, in the previous study um, showed that these markers are elevated, were elevated in e-cig users compared to non-smokers. But for isoprostane, even after covariate adjustment, the mean non-vaping level was notably um, higher than the mean vaping level, suggesting that there may be external exposures causing the elevated um, eight isoprostane levels in non-vaping subjects. And for metallothionine, the mean vaping level um, is much higher than the non-vaping level after covariate adjustment, which is reflective of uh, the previous study showing that this marker was elevated in ESIG users and supports that ESIG aerosol contains metal constituents and free radicals that are being inhaled. Uh, so to see if there is a change in these markers after working one shift, I took the ratio of the concentrations of the end to the start of the shift um, and used the one sample rank sum test to see if there's a statistically significant change from a value of one. So the value of one is indicated in the um, dashed red line. Um, so significance was detected for cotinine, um, CRP, and metallothionine among vape vaping workers. So next, now um, seeing that the concentration changes across the whole sampling campaign um, for each worker, with the box, box plots being the range of the concentrations and the color dot in the center being the adjusted means. Um, uh, for cotinine, the levels are pretty stable at, at each sampling point among vaping workers, but then among non-vaping workers, there's you see that there's um, an increase uh, from day one to day two. So this is an interesting trend on the non-vaping side indicating that perhaps ESIC aerosol from working in the vape shop is being absorbed by um, the non-vaping vape shop worker. As for the oxidative stress and inflammation markers, um, on the vaping worker side, the trends largely align with each other um, with this sort of slight U-shaped trend with the increase happening from start of day two to end of day two. On the non-vaping worker side, um, you see uh, for 8-OHEG and CRP, there's this um, zigzag pattern, a decrease from start to end on both uh, work shift days. Um, this shows that there's no significant elevation across a multiple work shift period um, for these uh, two biomarkers on the non-vaping side. But interestingly, for 8-isoprostane, um, um, you see that there's a slight upward trend from day one to day two. Now, as for metal toxicity um, on the vaping side, there is a sharp increase in metallothionine from start to end on day one, and another increase, but it's a softer one on, on the start to end on day two. On the non-vaping side, there is a similar zigzag trend as shown in the previous slide. So I do want to point attention though to um, going back to the MP to the metallothionine trend on the vaping worker side, it's interesting that you see that there's this big increase on day one. Um, and note that the increase in the oxidative stress markers, knowing that heavy metal and free radical exposure can increase oxidative stress response. You know, this, what I'm about to say, it, it needs to be further investigated, uh, but there's a possibility Ability that metallothionine's role as a heavy metal binding protein and scavenger for oxygen free radicals may have caused the um, markers the, in 8-OHDG and 8-isoprostane and CRP um, to decrease correspondingly. Mm -hmm. um, it's been reported that transcription of metallothionine is upregulated in response to reactive oxygen species uh, that induce or chemicals that induce oxidative stress to protect against oxidative damage. 
So it could be that vaping is eliciting uh, some kind of biological response among the ESIC users, um, but metalthionine may be mediating the oxidative stress effect. So um, here's another presentation of the data, but looking at um, the concentration ratios that I calculated um, with the urine concentrations at the start of the shift on day one as the denominator and doing the subsequent, um, making the subsequent um, urine concentrations at the um, subsequent um, sampling points being the numerator. Uh, so as you see um, on the vaping, top vaping panel, you see that there's um, a large, you know, see that large increase in, um, in metallothionine uh, at the, um, after the end of the first shift. Um, and then you see at uh, the um, concentrations for 8-OHGG and 8-isoprostane um, at the end of day two, they um, compared to the start um, at day one, uh, these, um, after you account for adjustment, these concentrations are elevated above a value of one. And then on the non-vaping side, um, which I think is the uh, most interesting um, finding um, from doing this biomarker concentration ratio analysis, um, we see that both um, cotinine um, at when you compare it to the urine concentration cotinine um, at the start of the shift, you see that there's um, after adjustment, you see that um, there's an increasing um, uh, concentration ratio for cotinine at um, on uh, day two for the start and end. Um, concentrations. And then um, for isoprostane, you see that uh, the levels, uh, the concentration ratio um, is also elevated above a value of one. So um, to see if there's a correlation uh, of cotinine um, and the effect biomarkers, so cotinine being um, an ex, uh, exposure marker to ESIC aerosols. Uh, I uh, did a simple linear regression analysis, um, and you can see that uh, among the vaping workers, there's um, a statistically significant association um, with cotinine um, for uh, 8-OHDG, uh, C-reactive protein, and metallothionine. Uh, which is consistent um, with the understanding that, of course, you know, ESIC users, they're directly inhaling the um, ESIC aerosol. They have a higher dosage, um, and we see these concentrations elevated um, across the shift um, and across multiple shifts um, with the concentration ratios that I presented uh, previously. And then among the non-vaping, you see that there's um, a positive um, significant correlation between um, cotinine and 8-isoprostane. So this shows that um, their, their uh, ESIC aerosol exposure through secondhand exposure at uh, the workplace may be um, a contributing factor to um, elevate, uh, an elevated um, response uh, in non-vaping workers with 8-isoprostane. So uh, next, uh, these are the results of the linear mixed effect model um, that I performed. Um, so uh, in understanding this graph, um, the percent change in these different effect biomarkers correspond to a one-fold increase in ur urinary cotinine. Um, in other words, um, this is how much, um, if you have like double the urinary cotinine, so double the um, ESIG aerosol exposure um, using cotinine as a marker, um, you would have this percent increase um, in the um, effect biomarker correspondingly. So on the vaping side, 
uh, you see that there's um, significant um, um, association among 8-OHEG, CRP, and, uh, and metallothionine. So consistent with um, the simple linear reg regressions that um, I measured with uh, the raw uh, concentrations in the previous slide. And then uh, on the non-vaping side, um, uh, you see that um, when you uh, account um, vape shop as a random intercept in the model, um, you see that 8-isoprostane um, does have a significant association. So this indicates that um, there, um, some, there's something going on during the work shift, whether it's exposure to XL ESIC aerosols or something, you know, maybe not maybe directly from ESIC aerosols, but um, could be work stress, lifestyle, the location of where the vape shop is located, um, something with um, the workplace that is contributing to um, an increase and isoprostane expression among non-vaping workers. So uh, this one, I, I performed the same linear mixed effect models, but this time looking at um, potential predictors of exposure. So that's vaping density, air nicotine concentration, shift length, and of course, um, the just the percent change in cotinine um, from start uh, to end of a shift. Um, so the main um, predictors uh, on the non-vaping side is the air nicotine concentration. So um, this is also reflective of um, um, workplace contribution um, of exhaled ESIC aerosols to um, the um, cotinine levels among non-vaping workers in their urine. And then uh, for the vaping side, um, we see that um, the increased uh, cotinine concentrations in their urine um, are contributing to elevated metallothionine um, levels uh, among vaping workers. Okay, so with these findings, um, the main questions, and I got uh, this question during when I presented this uh, presentation as part of my doctoral defense is, are e-cig aerosols harmful? how harmful are they compared to tobacco smoke? So, so in order to investigate these questions, I looked at um, you know, the changes in cotinine and measured the effect sizes uh, among different um, existing literature that I could find um, uh, with workers or with workers that are exposed to secondhand tobacco smoke or um, other, um, studies that looked at secondhand exposure to e-cigarette aerosols, compared that to the results in my study, um, calculated effect sizes and compared each other. So you can see, so the, the pink square um, highlights um, the results in my study. Um, you can see that the range um, of the concentration, the, the change, the cotinine changes in the urine um, in my study, um, are comparable to um, what's found uh, among um, non-smoking residents living with e-cig users. So this is the range of the effect size that I have in my study. Um, it's below what's been found uh, among attendees at an e-cig convention, um, which um, makes sense since at an e-cig convention, there's much larger um, act, vaping activity going on. And then um, for casino workers and smoking bar patrons where they're exposed to um, tobacco smoke, um, the absorption of, of nicotine um, is, not as, um, is not as large as what uh, you'd expect when you're exposed to, um, when you're a worker exposed to tobacco smoke. Uh, and now looking at, um, uh, the oxidative stress markers uh, among um, uh, the vaping group, um, I calculated um, the effect sizes for 8-arsoprostane uh, within the second day shifts, and that's where um, we saw that there were the increases in those health markers, and compared that to effect sizes that I calculated for um, uh, healthy smokers that smoked um, two cigarettes, uh, and these were measured 
uh, the isoprostin was measured in their breath condensate, condensate 15 minutes and five hours after they smoked uh, cigarettes. And you see that um, the effect size that I calculated in my study was much smaller than um, what I calculated from um, the, the other literature. Uh, so this shows that um, the um, oxidative stress effect um, represented as measured with 8 isoprostane um, is uh, much lower than um, if you were to smoke cigarettes. Uh, and then, um, you know, looking at 8 OHDG, um, not looking at effect sizes, but just the percent of association, um, I found that there's 25 to 27 percent increase in urinary o 8 OHDG if you um, increase cotinine, if the cotinine urine concentration um, increase one fold, and that's lower than among um, smoking office workers, that association was shown to be 63%. So um, again, um, among um, e-cig users, uh, there is sort of a harm reduction, um, if you wanna call it, um, compared to um, tobacco cigarettes. Now, among the non-vaping workers with 8-isoprostane, um, you see here the effect sizes that I measured among my study. Uh, they're within uh, the same. They're within the range as what's uh, captured um, among attendees, non-smoking attendees at an ESIC convention, um, and um, patrons um, exposed to outdoor secondhand smoke at a bar or restaurant. So this is interesting because um, you know, given that with uh, among vaping users, uh, there seems to be a a, a um, uh, uh, less uh, effect in terms of expression of uh, these um, oxidative stress markers, but um, the oxidative stress uh, expression from uh, exposure to uh, secondhand nicotine, um, e-cig-related secondhand nicotine, um, it's, you could say it's, um, could be, um, even though lower on a mean range, but it's it's within the same range as if somebody were to be exposed um, to tobacco smoke and have a oxidative stress response from it. Uh, so that that's something interesting. So in terms of um, conclusions and remaining research gaps, um, so for each of the learning objectives, um, first one uh, found that elevated oxidative stress, inflammation, and metal toxicity or, or reactive oxygen, oxygen species markers were stronger among ESIG using vape shop workers due to them having a larger ESIG aerosol dosage. Uh, but among non-ESIG using vape shop workers that have a consecutive workday schedule, um, you, I saw that there was a corresponding upward trend in cotinine and 8-isoprostane. Now, for identifying potential predictors of exposure and effect uh, among vaping workers, urinary cotinine um, is significantly associated with most of the study urinary effect markers and at a higher degree compared to non-vaping workers. Um, but interestingly, with urinary cotinine, it's significantly associated with the urinary 8-isoprostane levels um, when accounting for vape shop differences, suggesting that the worksite characteristics including exposure to exhaled e sig aerosol may play a factor in increased oxidative stress among these workers. And lastly, um, uh, that big question about um, comparing e sig aerosol effects with tobacco smoking. e sig aerosols produce less acute lipid peroxidation effect and contribute less to oxidative DNA damage than tobacco smoke, um, but lipid peroxidation effect from workship exposure to exhale e sig aerosols are within the range um, of what's found among um, those exposed to secondhand smoke or environmental tobacco smoke in outdoor settings. So in terms of remaining research gaps, um, you know, knowing um, what kind of effects in the indoor air quality um, experience in vape shops, um, there needs to be um, some uh, mitigation strategies tested to identify what best uh, can reduce e sig aerosol exposure in vape shops. Um, as uh, you can see um, with um, the um, significant amount of marijuana use um, that's um, prevalent among 
eSIG users. Um, there uh, should be more research in terms of um, studying um, these kind of impacts among dual users. So that could be an eSIG user that also is uh, smoking tobacco cigarettes or using cannabis. Um, and then um, looking at eSIG aerosol exposure um, by workers in business, businesses that are next door to the vape shop. So one thing um, in terms of um, most recent um, news in terms of vaping regulation, um, Proposition 31, uh, this was first introduced as uh, a bill in 2020. It was upheld by California voters um, in this recent um, November election. Um, so Prop 31, or, or this bill, but then Prop 31 uh, was a proposition that um, would um, uh, just allow voters to decide whether to keep um, this ban or not. It prohibits the sale of flavored tobacco products. This includes flavored vaping products. So this, because this um, tobacco product flavor ban passed, um, it makes California the fifth state to have a sale ban on flavored vaping products. So this is another um, big opportunity for studying the mitigation effect through sale bans on e aerosol exposure in vape shops. So um, this study um, it is, was supported by the Tobacco Related Disease Research Program, or TRDRP, um, the Southern California NIOSH Education and Research Center at UCLA, and the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health at UCLA. Um, of course, I want to thank uh, my PhD advisor, Dr. Yu Feng Zhu, um, and the participating vape shop and vape shop workers. Um, this work wouldn't be possible without them. And I also want to thank um, all of my laboratory colleagues um, and teammates that helped me on this research. And this concludes my presentation. Um, hopefully there's, there's uh, some time to answer any questions. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing your research with us. We do have some questions already coming in. So we'll just start right at the beginning. Um, was it hard to find vape shop workers who did not vape? Yes, it's hard <laughs> because, um, you know, as, as I explained earlier, like vape, vape shops are sort of this hub for, for um, people who vape um, or um, as I'm seeing more vape shops are becoming like dual vape and smoke shops. So it, it attracts a certain crowd that vape smokes or, or does um, any kind of like substances of the like. Um, it's really hard to find uh, vape shop workers who don't vape. And because, you know, um, it's sort of a requirement or, or it's, it's a plus that the employees know about the products, um, it's, it's very rare to find um, it's rare to find a non-vaping worker, especially when um, you know customers want to hear about recommendations of what flavor is good, what eSIC device works well. So you would need to have um, sort of first-hand account for that. So that's why a lot of the vape shop workers uh, are also vaping as well. Thank you. How about workers um, sorting used vaping devices and e-cigarettes for disposal? Are you aware of any health harms related to that? So with disposable vapes, um, I, in term, I, I'm aware of like with my lab, there um, have been studies conducted in terms of exposing um, like vaping aerosols from Juul or puff bars, those are, um, uh, sort of the common uh, disposable uh, vape um, or pod-based vape um, brands. There's also much more brands to um, those disposable vapes. They're always coming out with different, um, like there's always, they're different manufacturers and uh, 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 different flavors, et cetera. But I, I know in terms of um, that work, they are exposing like cell lines uh, directly to these vaping aerosols and um, we're seeing like toxicity from them. Um, but yes, in, in terms of um, those disposable vapes because of the high nicotine um, concentration um, in these disposable vapes since they use a nicotine salt, which is a much more potent um, nicotine um, uh, mixture. Um, yeah, we're seeing, um, as I recall from these studies, they're seeing um, like a toxicity um, from those disposable vapes. 
Thank you. Um, were you concerned with chemical composition of the different vape flavors? Did that play into it? Yeah, so um, in the employee surveys that I administered, um, I asked them to provide, you know, the uh, flavor composition um, of their e-liquid. Um, and um, because, you know, there's so many flavor mixtures, um, flavor types, um, just with the small sample size that I had, I couldn't really identify any trends in terms of what particular flavoring compound or, or, or chemical that's used for flavoring um, has um, kind of an impact or contributing factor to the biomarker concentrations that I measured. Um, so, um, but I know in terms of like some flavoring compounds like um, that have shown toxicity um, or, or a toxic compound like diacetyl, um, some uh, anything with like an aldehyde, um, uh, aldehyde makeup. Um, those have been shown to have um, some toxic effect. But with regards to my study, um, because of the small sample size and the various flavoring uh, compositions that uh, the employee reported, I um, unfortunately couldn't find any trend or connection with, with the flavoring compound. Thank you. Um, and we have um, two more questions that I want to make sure we, we put in here right before we end. Uh, the first is, are there any regulations for minimum ventilation specific to vape shops, and particularly in California? Yeah, so um, with ventil so, um, you know, with ventilation standards, um, so these aren't like regulation as in they're enforced as a regulation, but they're more like guidelines. Um, ASHRAE, um, they, uh, you know, regularly update their ventilation guidelines for different types of indoor environments. So with the vape shop, because they are a retail establishment, um, I, they um, recommend a, a certain um, minim minimum ventilation for that. So you would find that kind of, um, ventilation standard since retail establishment, you know, it'd be the same as if you go to like, um, just whatever, you know, clothing store, department store, any kind of store that's just selling whatever merchandise. Um, and since, um, you know, uh, inside the vape shop, there's like active um, release of uh, particulates going on, um, that ventilation standard that ASHRAE has for that kind of establishment is may not be enough. Um, but I know um, ASHRAE also recommends that, uh, you know, any place with um, environmental tobacco smoke or, or a release of um, tobacco, you know, any kind of like tobacco smoke, um, the recommendation is to, you know, eliminate that source or seclude it, uh, isolate it from um, the other areas where there may be uh, people who aren't smoking um, or working. Um, and um, I would think that that kind of standard would be um, translated the same way with um, exhaled e aerosols, but that's not explicitly um, stated in the ASHRAE uh, guideline. Thank you so much. And the final question we have time for today, um, do you perform baseline spirometry on all subjects to rule out any pre-existing lung function disorders? Uh, I... Um, because this was a pilot study, um, but that's um, a good suggestion in terms of um, ruling out um, those kind of subjects with um, respiratory issues. Um, that could be applied for like a larger study, but within the study, um, I uh, didn't perform um, that um, screening um, procedure. But, but that's a good idea um, to make sure to rule out any um, subjects with um, lung dysfunction. Thank you so much for sharing your research with us today. We appreciate all of you joining us. We appreciate all the questions that came in. Um, excellent job. Thank you again so much for joining us, Dr. Nguyen. And if you'd like to learn more about upcoming events and webinars, you can visit us at coeh at berkeley.edu backslash about CE. Um, you'll also receive an email tomorrow with a link to the evaluation, which will qualify you for a certificate of completion if you attended the full length of this webinar today. And thank you again, Dr. Wynn, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so much, everyone.
Thank you.